I will put up the microphones and I will say hello and good afternoon and welcome to Isle of Wight Radio and uh, the studio here and your questions too. My name's Lucy and uh, joining me here in the studio is the leader of the Isle of Wight Council and we've got loads of things to talk about. You will be delighted to hear Councillor Dave Stewart. Thanks very much. Hi Lucy and uh, good afternoon and thank you for inviting me in. Okay Dave, so we've been uh, asking people for questions over the last uh, couple of days or so, over the last 24 hours or so and we've got plenty in so I'm going to kick straight off with those because we've got a, a fairly limited amount of time. Yeah, let's go for it. Um, this one in from uh, Roz Roberts. Uh, lots of questions from Roz we had. Now some of them Roz, uh, they weren't uh, Isla White Council Related, So I'm going to hang on to those because the plan is that we will do this uh, moving forward with other people as well. But uh, the one I did want to put to you, uh, Councillor Stewart, is when will the Isle of Wight be getting a hostel for the homeless? Now, we had a bus shelter project that's um, uh, run into some problems. We know that. We haven't uh, heard much more on that. and We're waiting to hear on that. So we are approaching winter. There's a lot of concern about people on the Isle of Wight. And, and what happens now? What's the Isle of Wight Council doing to support that? OK, well, I think there's two points there. First of all, all those that need a home are in need of a home will be found one. Um, but we do have, um, I think when I last looked, it was uh, over 170 people in temporary accommodation, um, which for me is not only not acceptable, but actually it's a lot more expensive than if we can do something to actually get them people into a home where they want to be. Um, so um, we're, we're looking at that now. We've been talking about that as being one of our priority areas, and I think it's mentioned in our plan. Um, in terms of those people that use the bus shelter, I'm already speaking with the cabinet member responsible for that is Barry um, Abraham and also uh, some interesting things the bus shelter because it affects adults and children strangely enough so we're looking at how we can um, utilize that again with all the safeguards that are really necessary um, to make sure that we don't put people into an unsafe environment um, but it was a good project is a good project it's on the radar and I would say as soon as practicable is the answer to that question. I mean time is ticking isn't it and it does rather rely on other people um, doing what was once provided for at least supported by the council to a certain level and those facilities at uh, was it Downside Middle originally that that, that have now gone um, are you going to be there in time for the cold weather? Well I'd like to think we are and um, certainly as a result of that very good question um, amongst the many things I've been doing as you appreciate we've, we've just launched our, our our plan for the island for the next four years um, I'll take that away and I'll thank Ros for that question and I'll make sure I've got the clear picture of where we are with that so your first question there has already influenced council policy which is quite nice so we will come back to you in what a couple of weeks and you yeah, will tell us yeah let's get an update on that so um, make sure you follow that through with me and I will just see where we are for the winter because I think you've raised a really good point there um, I'd like to think we have minimal I'm not saying none but minimal homeless on our streets um, people that have gone to other places as I've done recently Birmingham, Manchester um, will be very saddened to see some of the people that are literally living on the streets there um, and I think one of our things as an island we should be able to do the best we can for people that live in our community. And you touched on there the 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 other side of it it's not just about people on the streets you, you you know you have to be there as a council supporting people who suddenly find themselves in a position where they don't have a home tonight um, but maybe longer term they can sort themselves out. What's the situation there how many people are you supporting and, and are you managing to support all of those that need it? Okay so so those that need a home and fit the criteria that we have to use um, are supported. Um, as I say, I've got a figure of 178 actually in my mind, but that figure may vary depending on what we've done. Um, longer term, though, what we really want to do is find appropriate homes for them um, and also um, for a number of our other people on the island, particularly young people who can't even afford to get onto the housing market. So affordable homes and homes for people is a priority. It's a priority for us locally and, as you know, it's a priority for the government as well. All right. OK, so uh, let's move on then, if we may. And this question from Mandy Williams. How are you helping the youth on the island? We've touched a little bit about uh, young people who need houses. Uh, but in a, in a wider sense, uh, they are the future, says Mandy. They need support and guidance to make this island a great place in future. What are you doing in terms of providing for the island's young people? OK, um, a number of things. Uh, 
first of all, I think foremost is we want to make sure our young people have got a future here on the island. I've talked in the past about trying to do something about the brain drain and losing a lot of our young people because that affects what this island becomes and we don't want this just to become a retirement home. Um, we enjoy having people here who want to retire because that's one of the attractions. But we have to offer a future for our young people. So I was talking to you earlier before we started the programme, you know, we're trying to engage closely with our island young people. Um, I've got a digital conference coming up in November where we've made a specific inclusion of young people from across the island into what may, might be digital business opportunities and they're going to be competing against their older peers to see what they're doing. Um, we've made a determined effort that we're going to hold an island youth conference, so a, an opportunity for our 18 to 24 year olds to actually say what they want in their future because in five years time they are main island workers. So we need to engage and obviously through the education world um, we're determined to make sure our young people have an opportunity. One of the benefits of me being able to work so closely with Bob Celia MP is that we can actually challenge some of the new ideas that are out there. Really good apprenticeships for young people, not just about going to university. Um, CCAM, uh, sorry, the, the centre over at East Cows for apprenticeships, I've been out there and it's really, really good. Um, but we also want to do something about the higher education. Bob and I are already talking about can we um, create a situation where we can have a un university type position it may be a, an outlier it may be a specialist area for say the marine engineering or some of the other skills that we've got here so we are determined that we're going to look after the young people on the island as i say we're having a conference probably in the new year which paul brading who's our education and the young people lead will be working up and we're going to bring our island youngsters in to let them have their say and, and actually give us guidance because we don't have the font of all knowledge on this I'd like to think the young people on the island have feel in their mind they've got a choice. Yes, I could go off and do some stuff, and that's fine. Um, but actually, I could also stay on the island because it's a great place to live. How realistic is that? I mean, when uh, you know, in terms of the university idea, that's a, a major investment somewhere along the line, and there doesn't seem to be an awful lot of money around. And the schools will tell you they're already struggling financially uh, to provide basic things like you know bits of photocopied work and pencils so to have this kind of idea which sounds fantastic I mean how deliverable is that really well you've got to make it um, deliverable by actually having a clear plan so we know um, the levels of our schools are at and let's not forget there's some very good schools on the island um, and they're working well um, we have a sixth form that is uh, and to be honest is quite des dis disparate in the sense that it's distributed all over the island and we should have a sixth form that is really giving us the standards we want whether that's one or two sixth forms in the future I don't know but we're just looking at the whole picture. Do you, do you not think that we have a sixth form that's working at the moment? I think we have and I don't think the results if they speak for themselves I don't think our sixth form results are as good as they could be we want our young people that are going for their A levels to be able to get on and get into the, the quality university places they want uh, and I think we have to look at that and be bold enough to say if we're going to give our island a future let's give our young people a future so that's that level university wise I don't think it actually is as um, mission impossible as people like to make out I mean we've got good connections already with Southampton and Portsmouth Bournemouth uh, and other universities and the campus option particularly around some of the specialist areas, I think is something we can achieve. And again, Bob Seeley and I are working hard on that at the moment. All right. OK, we might uh, well come back to some of those issues, but yeah. uh, let's go on to the next one, which I'm sure you must uh, know is going to come up. This one from Ebby Floyd. When is floaty going to float? Uh, the ongoing issue with the floating bridge, people currently juggling uh, two different launches. One costs them X, one costs them Y. No one really knows uh, what they're supposed to pay when they turn up. It's all a, a very confusing situation. Everyone just wants the floating bridge back on. Yeah. Well, well, I think Ebby's actually raised two issues um, because uh, we haven't resolved the name of the bridge yet. And if we're going to have it up and running, we need to get a name for it as well. Maybe that's something that will come at the end and probably would influence now what would have been names before. Um, but the, way, the approach I've taken with this, it is an issue. Um, we know, and I know personally, that the people in East Cows and West Cows have felt the impact of this. So I've been down there talking to the town and parish councils, to residents, to the local councillors. It is a challenge. Um, We've also now got the local enterprise partnership asking the same question because at the end of the day, you know, they gave us three million pounds to put a boat into the water to provide a new service. And it's not currently doing the service it was provided for. So there's also them looking on. Um, the answer to your question is well, I'm taking what I call a restore and review approach. So Councillor Ian Ward, who's our lead member for infrastructure and transport, uh, is focused on doing what is necessary to get the boat 
back into the water and providing a service. Has uh, has Ian been riding the replacement service since? Because when I spoke to him previously, he wasn't really sure uh, about the floating bridge and, and sort of admitted to me that he hadn't really ridden on it for about 10 years and wasn't really sure what was going on. Has he actually been on the ground, used the pedestrian launch and tried it out as a passenger and found out what, what's going on there? Uh, well, I don't know the answer to that question, to be honest, because I haven't asked him that, but I will do. But I've been down to the Jenny Lee and also see, and I've previously been on the Harbour Taxi that was at Fishbourne, at, um, uh, down at the Folly. Um, but I think in answer to your question, which is a bit broader than that, the other side of restoring it is reviewing what on earth's gone on. And I've got a small team working on that. And the first thing I asked them to do was to go down to the floating bridge, have a look for yourself, listen to the chains, have a look at what's going on, and you can see there the Jenny Lee, and you can see the others, and familiarise yourself because we are asking the question: How do we get in this place? Now, this bridge was ordered and paid for back last year um, under the previous administration. We came in, if you recall, just around the election in May, and the first thing that's arriving is a bridge that now doesn't appear to me to be fit for purpose. However, you did, you you know, effectively signed it off because you had a launch, not in the in the physical, you know, snagless yeah. tick, box, yeah. tick box kind of way, but you as a council personally launched it. That wasn't to do with the old council. No, that no, was to and, do with and, you. and I've deliberately not made play of that because I can't at this stage until I've had a look at it. Put, and I'm not looking to portion blame, I want to get to the facts. But I'm just explaining to you, it came to us in, in May of this year. But I think we have a duty to put it right. And we have a duty to give that service back to that whole area because it's had quite an impact. I fully understand that. So we're looking into the detail. A lot of people have spent a lot of time saying how it should have been done and all the different things. But actually, we need to deal with the now. So for me, it's about getting it right and getting it in. I've been on the bridge. In fact, I've been on the bridge a couple of times now. And I've been on it when it's not working because you may or may not be aware that we have staff down there 24 hours a day because they have to move it, otherwise it would actually get physically grounded. Um, and I've looked and I've listened um, and I think there are some real challenges there, but I don't think it's beyond the wit of man to sort it out. And um, I, whilst I won't put a specific time on it, I think it will be done a lot sooner than we think. Um, and I know that uh, already the key partners involved are working hard to get it fixed. Um, what, two, two more quick points. What's your message to, to people who are working part time one side of the water and, uh, you know, in this situation where they pay to go across and then suddenly they have to pay to come back because that's the way they're... The evening they're, ferry works. You know, yeah. are we talking about uh, raising the cost of crossing the Medina by stealth here? Are we going to get to a, a point where you go, well, actually, you've been paying pound fifty to go across and then you've been happy to pay the pound fifty to come back so we're going to raise the prices to cover for all of this okay um well i'm not going to predict the absolute future but my understanding at this time is that we have secured a, a service to provide people to get across in the daytime with the uh, support of red funnel and i recognize that i i do acknowledge the contribution they're making they've kept the evening service there as well the cost although it does finish an hour at least an hour earlier than it should be doing yeah, is that it's, right it, 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 i don't know exactly when it finishes because i don't know how the end hour is but what i would say is it is not perfect Actually, that's not the service we really want in the long run. But what we've done is to provide a service that would deal with this interim period. My personal view is let's get it back, the proper bridge, back into service. But it has to go back working as good as it can be. And I say it in that way because it may not be perfect. Um, but then the main aim is to get an adequate service. And I've spoken to the local councillor on this. And we were talking about the fact we don't want it just to go back in, to come back out again. Otherwise, we'll be going around a circle. Um, I believe we will get it back. We will get it back into a standard that is suitable. And then we need to look at what the impact of that's been on the community. Because I've had a number of correspondents, you can imagine, from businesses and people. It's had an impact. And I've not lost that. But at the moment, it's to do what we're doing. Get it fixed. Get it back on the water. Have a look at why it went wrong. And then we can look ahead to see what we're going to do in terms of the cost. But don't forget, it's costing us... I think it costs over half a million pounds now at a time when I'm sitting looking at how do I find 7.5 million pounds in the budget. So it's a challenging role. It is a, challenge, a challenging role, although you are talking to people who are trying to find pound fifty out of a very small yeah. budget to yeah. get across. Yeah. Um, but let's move on. Let's talk uh, health now, if we may. And this comes from Dr. Ian McLennan who is a retired NHS GP and a consultant in public health. Uh, the corporate plan vision that you are commending to Islanders states that the council intends to champion the needs of the island's community in the development and implementation of the NHS-sponsored Hampshire and Isle of Wight Sustainability Transpo uh, Transformation 
plan or program, the STP. Uh, Ian's question is this. Will Councillor Stewart confirm that in championing the needs of the island's community, the council will challenge the development and implementation of the STP? He's saying that the administration has no democratic mandate to support the plan. He says it will increase the cost and inconvenience to islanders accessing essential health services because he says uh, it'll lead to the closing of so-called unsustainable services at St Mary's and centralising them in large hospitals on the mainland. So will you ensure that there is a full public consultation on the STP? How will you make sure that local services here aren't lost to the mainland? Okay, so um, a lot of questions in there actually and I'll just give you my picture as it stands at the moment and let's talk it in simple terms. Um, it is expensive for people to receive treatment on the island. There are some treatments that people won't want on the island because they need the specialist services at Southampton or Portsmouth, you know, for example, cancer treatment uh, and the other life-threatening issues. Although I suspect they would rather have the specialist services here, it's just they haven't got that as an option. That's right, and I think some of the service, I do wonder why we can't bring that over, so some of the repeat support you get and that, but there are some core elements that we can't do. Um, I also think we can do a lot more to get our service out into the community um, and use it. And so what we've done as, a, as a, a team, if you like, is said, let's approach a bit of a dual role here. So what has to go to the mainland, the acute, if you call it, services, fine, we'll make that and we'll try and make that journey as painless as we can for people because it's not enjoyable if you're not well having to then travel on ferries. To Although get how, how does it stand in terms of financial support for that? Because there were conservative cuts to the way people were mm. being supported and getting across the water. So when you say you're supporting people, how are you supporting people? Well, making sure, first of all, they can get there. Um, as you know, the council's got a small budget that it put in a while back now to support um, people going over. But the main thrust of the budget is actually the health service who means test what people can do. We also have the ferry companies um, who discount travel for some people. Um, I'm actually asking them if they'll discount the lot and actually say, you know, but that's a, a discussion we've yet to fulfil. But I think it would be good if they could, because with the council under the pressures we are, we can't do our bit forever. We have to look at what's the priority. But most important, back to your question, is what does island care look like in the future? So the STP, which previously hasn't been signed up to at all, um, we're now meeting with Hampshire, who's also looking at their STP, to try and do a whole picture approach to this so that we can work together. And this is where I think some of the partnership relationships are useful. Um, and the Southampton um, lead, whose name is Dave, and I can't remember his surname, and I were talking about this at recent meetings. So we're going to negotiate and discuss how that affects us. Um, public consultation will follow its normal course if that's what's required. I think the other thing to remember is... What uh, we, can I well, just jump in there? So you said if that's what's required, is it required, will well, you, it happen? I think you applied a full public inquiry uh, kind of approach and I've yet to establish what we need. Um, I think we need to know exactly what the benefits and risks are. You've got a doctor on board there with a question and I'm not saying he's wrong, you may well be right, I'm not a doctor, but my view on it is we need to see if this plan, it's a plan for health provision in Hampshire and the Isle of Wight under the NHS overall scheme is right for the islanders. So, so Dr. Um, uh, Dr. McLennan's question was, will you ensure there is a public consultation on the STP? Yes or no? Well, there needs to be a public consultation on what we're doing and that will be an ongoing process. How we do that will be important because you can consult with the public in many ways. The other thing to point out to Mr. McLennan, which you may not know, uh, I've personally taken control of the, as, a, as the chair of the Hampshire, uh, sorry, the um, Health and Wellbeing Board for the island because I see this as such an important issue. Anybody will know that when you talk about surgeries on the island, medical treatment, elderly people, this is a very important issue to us as islanders. So for me, it's about driving our health and wellbeing board to make those kind of things on there. And the STP is on our agenda. Okie dokie. I know that uh, these are all very big issues we're talking about. I have no doubt we'll be back talking about some of these again. Uh, on to the next one, Rookley. Uh, following the purchase of Rookley Country Park, all owners on the site have now been given notice of eviction, some by this December, the remainder by December 2018. People will be losing up to £40,000 through no fault of their own. There is no offer for compensation or financial help from the services. There is nowhere on the island, says uh, this question, to site older caravans over 10 years of age. What can the Isle of Wight Council do to support the owners at Rookley? Okay, so my understanding there is that what people have done is invested in the caravans, 
but obviously they don't own the land that the caravans are on and the owners of Rookley Country Park have exercised their right to change the world in which they have, which it must be challenging for people because some of those caravans excuse me <clears throat> some of those caravans can cost quite a significant amount of money um, but also it's their home to them in many ways so I think if there are people first of all in extreme hardship over us they should contact the council because we have the ability to deal with that I think we're probably more talking here about how people can move themselves into another location where they can carry on living in that way um, and where can they go is the question so not having been prepared with options on that one I will again take that away refer that through to our housing team um, particularly Councillor um, Barry Abrahams who deals with that side and see how we can support those people um, and then we can only take it from there I think Okie dokie. All right, so we will uh, make a note. I'm making a little star. Got a few notes, yeah. We will come back on that one. Uh, the Island Learning Centre retrospective permission is now being sought for permission to build a classroom on the site of the current Island Learning Centre. Uh, it's because a level survey wasn't undertaken as part of the planning application process, and then it turned out that the site wasn't quite right for the classroom that wanted to go there. So now the council is seeking planning permission from itself retrospectively yeah. to site the caravan and there are some concerned locals there saying well hang on a second this is a few yards from my back garden and I haven't really had a chance to to comment publicly on this where are you with that and what message of uh, of uh, well I suppose what 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 can you say to local residents concerned by that well if anybody ever raises an issue in the ward where I am jail night and well I'll ask them to come to me as the local councillor first of all and give me the opportunity to do my work which is to represent their interests so the first thing is individually if they've got concerns and you indicated that I think they should go to their local councillor and let that come into the system um, what I can also do if there are concerns and people have got those points is raise them with Paul Brading who's our lead for education and learning um, and officers and, and but I'm not putting the responsibility on them we're the lead we will we, we'll show the leadership if you like um, to have a look at this and see if there's any impact um, it does seem strange the Isle of Wight Council applying for planning permission for retrospectively itself retrospectively as well Re which uh... yeah. so um, I don't think there's anything wrong in them doing that in terms of technically but I need to find out exactly what the details are on there so if the person who has raised the question wants to email me direct and my email is david.stuart at iow.gov.uk then I will get them a proper reply so that they can know the update. Um, I don't know the full details of the council applying to itself for the planning permission on that particular item but I can find out so I will. Brilliant. All right. So next one is Dinosaur Isle. Uh, will this continue to be a council owned and run facility moving forward? It's a brilliant, uh, if you don't know Dinosaur mm. Isle, it's a brilliant facility over at Yavland. Um, is it going to stay part of the Isle of Wight Council's offer? Well, I certainly get to the last bit. It's going to stay part of the council's offer insofar as we, um, I took the whole team down to see Dinosaur Isle recently. Did That's you? my cabinet team. <laughs> Um, and spoke with um, Dr Lockwood and, and other friends and, and also with a curator and, and others. And also, actually, to revisit Dinosaur Island, and if people haven't been there, I would encourage you to go down there because it is quite an amazing um, experience going in to look at what's there. Um, and one of the undertakings we, we took, and we've even discussed this recently, Dinosaur Island is an accredited uh, museum, which means it gets support at a national level and there's a lot of actually international interest and whatever final future it holds we have said we will want that accreditation to stay that is really important and it's really reassuring for the team that are there now whoever is the the, the questioner uh, may be aware that we've already looked out to see could somebody else run it better and more effectively could we expand it because we think that is a really good opportunity there to grow that whole offer down there in terms of not just dinosaur isle but the whole of sandown bay and if somebody comes forward and says, well, actually, you know, we'd like to invest in that and we'd like to do this and we've got all these good ideas, you will have seen, for example, recently in Dorset, they lost their opportunity to have their own little Jurassic Park, I think it was. And I was thinking, great, let's get that over to the Isle of Wight and do something like that then. So it's looking for the opportunities. Now, the council is not the necessarily best person to run that in the future. We need to understand that. I think what's most important is people need to know that I certainly and my colleagues are very um, impressed with what's at Dinosaur Isle and want actually that to grow as an offer. 
All right. Let's move on to the next one then, if we may. Uh, this is from Sue in Wooten. Uh, why do residents, Isle of Wight residents, have to pay for seafront parking off peak? So we know that the, the rules change for the winter. Um, it's demonstrated on the fact that you can take your dogs on certain areas of the beach where you can't in the summer. Um, and her point is, you know, during the summer, she understands it, tourist season, very busy. Uh, but why not remove that parking at the winter and make that accessible uh, across the island on seafront car parking? Well, Sue's not going to love me too much, but I'll be very honest with her. You know, why do people in other areas not pay? So seafronts, I think, at Shanklin or wherever, don't pay. So there's some inequality across the piece on this. Um, but to reassure Sue, and again, remind her to go to her local councillor, Barry Abraham, who is for Wooden, uh, and feed her thoughts in, um, in part of our budget reviewing at the moment, we're looking at the whole aspect of parking on the island. Um, there's people have got concerns around resident parking. People have got concerns about we pay in Newport, but you don't pay in Shankley, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we said we need to look at it in the round. The fact of life is parking is an income generation for the island, and it's one of those areas that helps us keep the services for people. So we can't say to everybody, well, actually, we're going to change it all and have no no parking fees. Um, so being honest about that. Having said that, I think there are some inequalities that we can look at, and we need to see what the benefit is against what the impact's having on the community. So we are going to look at the whole, and in fact, this week we agreed we're going to set some time aside just to look at as a whole team um, with our officers parking on the island. Um, so that could be it. bad news for some areas because, <clears> it, you know, is there a guarantee there that what you're saying is, do you know what, some, some areas are being treated unfairly, therefore we'll look at taking, you know, charges away from certain areas? Or what are you, are, are you saying, well, actually, some pay, places aren't paying, let's bring in the charges and make them pay? Mm, well, you, you may or may not be bad news because, in fact, you also have to think about the impact on businesses. So some areas in the community... Um, and I'm not saying this is an outcome because I haven't had the conversation yet, but let's take Sandown, which is really uh, suffering at the moment with the whole area of um, business. And we have to ask ourselves the question, what's the impact if you put charges? Do you drive people all away? You know, what are you trying to actually achieve? So you need to look at parking, but in the context of what we're trying to do about growing the island. And if you have to weigh that up, it's about the true value that we get. All right. I just want to rush through a couple more because yeah, I realise that you're, uh, you've got a time to, uh, to look at as well. Uh, £100 million, pounds, an investment in commercial properties. It's been agreed uh, by the Isle of Wight Council. First off, where did that money come from? Right. So the council, being a local authority, can borrow money effectively through the government, although uh, there'll be uh, the wording of that isn't clear, but we can borrow it at a very low rate. So, so let's say hypothetically 2% which is quite low. We can then, through the, and it happens elsewhere in the country, invest that money and maybe get a return around 7%. The net result of that is that's 5% for the island. So if you take 100 million, 5%, that means we're finding £5 million a year, every year, coming back into our budget um, at relatively, I'll say relatively low risk because there's never a no risk and I'm sure the financiers out there will say, yeah, there's, but the fact is this is an opportunity. Now, we have looked at it and we're going to work closely with Portsmouth, who have already been this about a year ahead of us, um, and others to make sure our commercial investments are those that will give us that return that we need. Um, it's a challenge, but it is a solution to having to the, uh, to the alternative, which might be to cut another 7.5 million next year. And that is really, really challenging. So we are saying, actually, let's look at doing things differently here. So and that's separate from regeneration. People get confused and say, why aren't we investing it into Newport Harbour? We've got a regeneration plan for Newport Harbour. We have a number of people who want to invest in Newport Harbour. So that's still going to happen. This is about a commercial investment, which is going to give us some money to offset our balance. Are we gambling public money on the, on the uh, property market? Um, I suppose nothing is for nothing. And there's always, but it, but it's a bit like where you are. This, the, if you like, the government is underwriting this in some ways, isn't it? Because we're borrowing it from the government. Um, I think whilst there's always a degree of risk based on the potential, and you make a very diverse set of um, investments, not just in one area, there's a potential here actually to make a real profit. And if I just give an example, our pension fund that we have in the council and other people have pension funds has returned some investment profits well above 7%. So it can work and it can work well. It's about being wise about how you do it. Uh, and have you, presumably you haven't bought anything yet. You haven't quite got to that stage. Um, no, we've approved it, as you know, just a few weeks ago. And Councillor Stuart Hutchinson, who's our lead on resources, is now working with um, the experts in the field and officers to move that forward. All right. Um, and as you came in today, you presented me with a, a 
golden piece of paper, uh, your plan moving forward. Do you want to uh, just give us an idea of what's on there? Yeah, so um, people will be able to go on the website uh, and, uh, and tonight at our cabinet we'll be looking to um, agree to take forward to the full council our corporate plan. In simple terms, the plan is saying what we're going to do over the next four years. So, you know, we've said we want the Isle of Wight to be an inspiring place to grow up, to work, to live and to visit. That's our overall aim. And through a series of priorities that we've set, that's how we're going to achieve it. Um, if people look back to the election, they will actually very quickly work out that what we said we would do in our manifesto as a Conservative group is what's in this plan. Um, but if you take the Conservative aspect away from it, I'd like to think actually that most councillors will say, do you know what, I can sign, I can sign up to some of that because it's good for the island. All right. I mean, I'm just going to pick you up on one of these uh, achievements mentioned yeah. here. It says we've helped to secure job opportunities for more than 600 people at a census, which is the new call centre um, on the outskirts of Cowes. Uh, we know there's nothing like 600 people there. And how many of those jobs that are there are actually full time permanent jobs and not temporary seasonal ones? Um, well, I'm not sure that we know that there isn't 600 jobs there because that is what's available. And in fact, we 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 know due to you know we 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 reported on this uh, okay. about two weeks ago that there are not 600 people there at the moment. Ah, right. Okay, so I do be coming from. So the 600 jobs are available there, and I suspect if they're successful, which they appear to be, um, that figure may even rise further because the one thing about the Ascensos building is you don't need to get a ferry to go to work. And so they can actually service across the country the work they do. And that means there's the opportunity for a lot more jobs. I went up there and had a visit, as clearly you have, and uh, it's quite impressive inside. But what the most impressed me the most was um, that I was told that at four out of the five jobs there are new jobs for people. They're not people just transferring across, which tells me we're having a significant impact on our unemployed people, which is important. You add on to that, you know, the fact that ASDA, which is here, um, has provided 250 jobs as well. Um, they are significant numbers and hopefully those people will want to live here, spend their money here, enjoy it. So we're actually getting investment into our economy. So I think it's a really good thing. Um, and if we get more companies to say, do you know what, actually we could go to the Isle of Wight and do some things like that because it's not abroad, it's here on the island, they can do the whole country. Maybe this is the start of a real digital world for us here on the island. But just to bring you back to the other question, how many of those jobs um, are, are permanent full-time ones and how many of those people are still going to be in work after the Christmas season, for example? <clears throat> well, I don't know the answer to the question, how many are going to be after the Christmas season. My impression and the brief conversation I have is that they are full-time jobs for those that want full-time. They're one of the benefits of this, of course, is the online economy has a lot more jobs generally in the summer because we're a tourist trade, but a lot less jobs in the winter when people go back to university or indeed aren't here on holiday. Because this is the other way around, because this is serving the needs of people for Christmas, for all the online sales they get and beyond that, and they're looking to grow. So it's actually giving us a bit of an interesting balance on that. I don't have all the details of all the numbers, and perhaps maybe I should do because it's commercial information, but I'm more happy to go and find that out if it would help you. Um, and, I, and one little addition, I'll, I'll say to that, this week alone we found out there were going to be job losses at BAE, and we found out there were going to be job losses at, at Gurit. So while, while it's brilliant to say, yes, we've created some jobs here, suddenly we've seen jobs slashed over here. What's your message to people who are currently under threat of redundancy on the island right and you're right i, I watched that happen and uh, it's probably the same and worse still for people in other areas of the country where bae systems have clearly trimmed down in order to meet whatever reason they've come up with i think it's down to the individual though. in terms of how yeah. you know it's about how it affects the individual as opposed to the big numbers isn't well it? if it's island individuals i'd say well one option you have is to go and apply to a census because they've got job vacancies there that you can now apply for they only started up in august as you know so there's that opportunity um we don't have control of all the decisions of all the companies on the island, but certainly we're very aware of that. And our overall goal is to reduce the unemployed. So we now have, I think it's 18, isn't it, from BAE Systems at Cows that we need. But then we've got other benefits. Our company investors over at um, Cows or East Cows in the Medina who produce the offshore wind turbine wings, which people see going up and down the Medina, um, well, they're walking into a market that's growing really fast. And those that have been to there offices and buildings will, like me, I'm sure, be impressed with the high quality super um, products that they have, which are now being bought worldwide. So you do lose some occasionally, like we've described, but then others are growing. And I think our role is to make sure we give everybody who's in the business world the opportunity to grow so the jobs are covered. It'll be interesting to come back to that one, actually, and yes, see where we will. are in a few yeah, months' yeah. time with that. Uh, why do you want to be council leader, Dave Stewart? Why, uh, why this particular role? Good question. Um, 
many people have asked me, well, I think you use the word is poison chalice, I think was a phrase. And I just think, well, yeah, why do I want to? I think three words for me. Um, I think it's a privilege being a young islander from Brading who's gone through our local school system, had a career off island um, and then come back into the island to lead the Isle of Wight Council for me is a privilege, to be honest. And uh, if nothing else in these four years, I hope I can leave a legacy that says to my, great, you know, my kids and grandkids, I did a bit for the island because they gave me a lot. They gave me a start in life. Um, it is a challenge. You're absolutely right. I've had to sit and look at budget figures that I never thought I would be. And, you know, what don't you do? What do you do? How do you reach this figure? But we said we will fix the figure and we will get there. Um, and that's the other thing, I think, with it. It's the determination to work with people that want to work with us to do the best we can for the island. So um, I'm up for the challenge. Um, I'm enjoying it, but with a caveat that it is challenging. Um, but I'm hoping that within the next few years, people on the island will say, actually, we got through that bad spell and we're coming out the other side. There's lots of opportunity. And I want to thank all those people who have come forward to offer us opportunities because they're our future. And with that challenge in mind, just give me your email address again, because I know there will be people that will want to get in contact. Yeah. So uh, it's david.stewart, spelled S-T-E-W-A-R-T at I-O-W.gov.uk. Um, you can imagine I get quite a few emails a day. Um, but nevertheless, all of them get looked at um, and I'll get back to people. And if there are particular questions people have got, oh, and they're in particular areas, like you've talked a lot about the planning and et cetera, I'll make sure they go to the right cabinet member who will then find out what they need. Because I think communicating with our community is really important and probably somewhere we're not that good at at the moment. Brilliant. All right. Well, Councillor Dave Stewart, leader of the Isle of Wight Council, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for joining us. Your questions to Dave Stewart, and we will be back with another Your Questions to very soon.